The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages presents Karwan Sarai Publishers. Subscribe to their four extraordinary magazines, bringing the ancient world to life. Ancient History. Warfare in the Age of Myth and Heroes. Ancient Warfare. Warfare in the Age of Kings and Castles. Medieval Warfare. It's time to play with history. War games, soldiers, and strategy. Karwan Sarai offers print and online issues and subscriptions. If you love history, subscribe today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale. And today, we are bringing you an introduction to a long series that's going to be titled Heroes or Villains of Medieval Iberia. Dr. Lincoln is going to be guiding us through a series of complicated subjects, eras, and historical personalities. And without further ado, Dr. Lincoln, firstly, thank you for coming on the show today. And secondly, would you guide the audience through an introductory course on what they can expect to see with our upcoming series? Thanks for having me, Nick. One of the things that we've talked about for a while uh, with this series is to do short biographical deep dives of about 30 minutes or so on a number of sometimes controversial, sometimes heroic, sometimes inspiring, sometimes contemptible uh, figures from medieval Iberian history. Uh, it goes uh, sort of without saying that uh, in a land that is often described as the land of the three faiths, we've got a number of entries. Um, so here today, one of the things I thought we should do is, is first give an outline of the nine figures we'll be covering, um, not necessarily in order, uh, and then um, to, to give a little bit of an overview of the kind of places and peoples we're dealing with, so that in future episodes, when we take a deep dive into any of those individual figures, uh, we have some context for what we're talking about. Uh, so the, the nine that we'll cover, um, and these are obviously just short versions of their names. Names are, are always complicated. They sometimes have patronyms. They sometimes have toponyms. They sometimes have tribal names and affiliations, but we've got quite a lot to go through um, in this set of nine. The first is, is Alfonso the first of Aragon and Navarra. He's often called the battler, Alfonso el Batallador. Uh, we've got Ibn Mardanish, Muhammad, Muhammad Ibn Sa'ad Ibn Mardanish, the, the Taifa king of Murcia. We've also got Gerardo Sem Pavor, a Portuguese adventurer who got into more than a little mischief in the southwestern frontiers. We've got the twin counts of Barcelona, Ramon Berenguer and Berenguer Ramon, uh, uh, an object lesson about family names if ever there were one. We've got Sancho Fernandez, a prince of Leon uh, from the early uh 13th and late 12th century. We've got Samuel ibn Nakrila, um, a, a high official in one of the Taifa kingdoms in the south um, during the first Taifa period. Uh, we've got Guillaume Ramon de Moncada, uh, a Catalan count who may or may not have murdered an archbishop. We've got Abdurrahman the I, uh, the first emir of a, of a separate Umayyad um, state in, in Iberia. Oh, and uh, we'll finish up because the Mythbusters told us you're always supposed to end with a bang. You're always supposed to save the best for last uh, with Rodrigo Diaz de Bivar, um, commonly known by his Arab Arabicizing epithet, al Um, So those nine uh, give us a, a, a good idea of what's coming up. But I think it's also important to talk about uh, the land that we're, we're really discussing. Now, medieval Iberia is full of all kinds of historiographical controversies. There's, there's a lot of debate about where we draw the lines um, between, uh, on the one hand, tolerance, um, and on the other hand, intolerance, how we, how we map the, the differences in the balance of power between religious communities, between political communities, and how we talk about those subjects based on the sources that we have. Now, it's worth noting a couple of things. First, uh, there are lots of popular books out there. Unfortunately, there are very few that are any good. Um, probably the, the best um, for my money on the, the wider um, history of, of Iberia for, for English uh, speaking audiences is the late Simon Barton's History of Spain. Unfortunately, although he was an award-winning, prize-winning, enormously important medieval hispanist um, who was taken from us far too early, 
Simon's book does not uh, give too much attention to medieval Iberia. So we're sort of left with, um, okay, well, if, if we don't have that sort of big, big survey, can we at least get the two parts of what we're dealing with? And, and the short version is we kind of can. On the one hand, the best book perhaps um, for popular audiences uh, interested in medieval um, Iberia's uh, Islamic populations is the great Brian Catloss's uh, wonderful book, Kingdoms of Faith, which I actually happen to have on an arm's reach. Uh, the cover looks like this, at least in, in hardcovers. It's a, a fantastic read. Um, and of course, Catlos is responsible for a number of really important translations of Arabic sources, and is perhaps one of the best um, historians of, of Islamic Iberia um, in the world today, certainly in the English-speaking world. On the other side of the, the peninsula, we're, we're sort of blessed with a, a surfeit. Um, the, the work of, of the eminent Joseph O'Callaghan comes to mind um, for histories of, of medieval Liberia uh, writ large. His venerable, but now um, quite dated by even his own admission, history of medieval Spain is, is quite useful, as was the late Peter Linehan's history and the historians of medieval Spain, a much more scholarly book, but still very readable because of, of eminence uh, of Linehan's wonderful style, although it, it can be a little bit difficult in translations just because there are certain English witticisms that don't translate very well. Those three books give us a kind of framing for, for some of the subjects we're talking about. We should be clear, though, about why we're talking about medieval Iberia and not just medieval Spain or medieval Portugal or even medieval Andorra, or medieval Gibraltar. The short version of any explanation about the geography of the peninsula is that it is inherently interconnected, but also divided. There are enormous mountain ranges that divide sections of, of Iberia from another. There are large rivers that when they flood can be catastrophic and smaller rivers that denote particular boundaries that created border zones that, that were ripe places um, for, for intercultural and cross-cultural connections, as well as military activities. Now, because most of the figures in this series have a, a nominally militarized bent, it's worth noting that they also engage with a lot of that geography. They wouldn't have called it Spain, and they don't. Even in the Latin sources where most of the Roman toponyms are preserved, they often refer to it as Spains in the plural, that is to say the several provinces of Roman Spain. And if we look at a, a map of Roman Spain with all of its, its individual uh, demarcations, whether it's the late Republican provinces, the Diocletian dioceses, or even the way that the Visigothic kingdom organized some of its territories with its strong borders against Galicia, that, that region that's for a while controlled by the Suevi uh, in the northwest of the peninsula, we can really kind of see that, that this is not all one place, nor was it all one people. We know that there's an enormous amount of early Celtiberian peoples. There are Basque populations that are deeply entrenched. We know that Roman colonization over the course of about four centuries was enormously influential in shaping uh, and reshaping the topography. There are evidence, there's strong evidence of bass uh, sites that, that date into to previous millennia. And there's also evidence of Roman aqueducts that still stand and form the walls, say at Segovia, or that provide uh, visitors to an archeological park in Merida a wonderful afternoon and more than a little shade in the, the sun. One of the challenges then that we have to think about are all of these layers, not just working against one another or shaping one another, but working together. It's often stated that in 711, for example, there's an Islamic invasion of Iberia. This is an inaccuracy in a number of ways, but I think it proves just how messy and complicated and muddled this history can often be. In the first place, the warriors that arrived from the other side of the Straits of Gibraltar were invited, and they were invited by Visigothic warlords who were themselves fighting a civil war. Second, most of the troops, if they were Muslim, were Muslim only in, in certain small and precursory fashions. The leadership certainly was. The leadership seems to have been thoroughly uh, a part of the early Islamic movement. But the varying degrees of Islamization, if we want to use that term, of conversion that had taken place into the rank and file is still something that eludes our ability to, to recover. We, we don't have great records from every rank and file soldier, nor do we have a, a poem the likes of uh, let us all go from the field of Flanders, right, where we get this evocative portrait of what the enlisted thought. Moreover, the Visigoths themselves were not all one group. There were warring factions, tribal affiliations, and subdivisions, all of which suggest enormously plural populations. Moreover, calling it an Islamic invasion rather than a civil war that went bad and turned out into a whole bunch of other settlement patterns may be a convenient shorthand, but it's important to remember for both 
this introductory video and also the variety of topics that we're going to be covering, that shorthands are often ways to, to cut corners and that cutting corners can be perfectly fine, except when we're trying to build something that's sturdy and durable. And therein lies the real challenge, digging deep and getting into the nitty gritty, into what the primary source is saying, into what scholarly conversations have shown really helps reveal the wide array of topics that are at, at our fingertips, but sometimes can just elude them. Uh, and so in taking this, this exploration of so many of these subjects, it's important to remember that we've got so many layers. We've got, yes, an invasion by forces allied with uh, the Umayyad Caliphate on the one hand in 711, but we've also got counter invasions by a number of forces back and forth, back and forth, tribal invasions, tribal resettlements, repopulations, counter repopulations, devastations, all of which suggest that at even the most macro of level between the Christian kingdoms nominally in the north and the Islamic kingdoms in the south, there's always a bit of a tension. But even those uh, large monoliths betray the kind of fragmented, plural, and overlapping networks of power that scholars have shown are hard at work on the ground. Moreover, it's worth remembering that these demographics are not static. What happened in 711 may have had a strong influence on what happened in 1212, but the two could not be farther apart. Those five centuries were enormously influential. Demography changes, customs change, languages change, cultures change, religions change. And so all of these diversities and pluralities suggest that while, for example, the most simplistic of popular stories would give you a good guys versus bad guys approach, or a Muslims versus Christians approach, or a Jews caught in the middle approach, the reality is far more complicated. And so one of the things I think we should explore in this series, Nick, generally, is about how we deal with this complexity, how we deal with heroes on the one side being villains on the other, and how the plurality of identities that they're always manipulating, that they're always wearing multiple hats, might tell us about the head that wears the crown in most of these instances, at least. So that's that's where I think we should start. That's where I think um, we're going. And, and hopefully over the course of, of the next nine episodes and maybe a, a wrap up where we can invite a few more people on, uh, we, we've got a, a pretty good idea of how complicated the situation really is um, and, and how unique and how special the history of medieval Liberia and its variety of important power brokers uh, can really be for understanding the medieval world in a much more rich and complex fashion. So